Welcome back to church this evening. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and the Josiah will come and lead us in some songs. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time we have again to come back this evening to worship you and to learn from your word and to sing praises to you. And Lord, I pray that you give us a good evening this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Special item. <laughs> Welcome to church this evening. The first song we're going to sing is Higher Ground. We're going to sing the first and the last verse of this one today. And if you can all stand with me for the opening song of the service. Stand, we're going to sing follow on. We're going to sing all three verses of follow on this morning or the evening. Good evening again, and it's time for the memory verse, so let's just get straight into that. So it's Proverbs 21, verse 2 and 3, I'll say that, you say that, and then off we go. Proverbs 21, verse 2 and 3. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And again... Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to that. The last one we're going to sing tonight before the message is a passion for thee. We're going to sing both verses of this one tonight. Thy breath. 
Take your Bibles, Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, it appears from what I understand of what I've been told that in the morning service this side seems to be cooler than this side, so everyone goes over here, but if everyone goes over here and it's cooler, doesn't it not become cooler because more bodies are on this side, I don't know, uh, but it seems in the evening service when we open those up and the breezes come in, everyone migrates left. Um, that's okay. We're just glad that you're here wherever you're sitting, right? Well, I am glad you're here. It doesn't appear you're glad you're here, but we're glad you're here nevertheless. All right, Mark chapter 10. And we're going to start reading in verse 35 and go all the way to verse 45. And we're going to continue on with our series on fact check and looking at some things that, from a human perspective, are the opposite of from God's perspective. And so Mark chapter 10, verse 35, it says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto him, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called to them, them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that which ye are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, when we think of people that are great, uh, we often think of people uh, who have power, people who have position, uh, people who have popularity, people who have a certain maybe athletic ability or vocal ability or, or any number of those things. Or maybe in today's day and age, we would use the word someone who has a lot of influence. That seems to be the new word, influencers, you know, online, all that type of stuff. And 
And we would think, well, those people are some great people. Well, in the passage of Scripture we just read, Jesus' disciples are really starting to look for personal ambition and glory, are they not? James and John are about to stir the pot a little bit. Because James and John come up to Jesus and they ask him, Hey, when you come into your glory, when you establish your kingdom, because remember, these are the disciples, they're still thinking a physical kingdom, correct? They're not thinking like a millennial kingdom like we're thinking of. They're thinking that he's going to overthrow Rome. He's going to become the king of Israel. He's going to rule and reign on David's throne. That's, that's their mind. That's in their mind, like, Jesus, when that happens, can we sit on your right hand? And on your left hand. Now, if you were the other ten, <laughs> would you like James and John after you hear that? Probably not. You know, you want to create a little bit of competition. You want to create a little bit of animosity. Here they are. And now this is just a small group. And this is what's already becoming and taking place. And, and thinking all those types of things. Jesus dealt with the core problem that the disciples had. And really, it's a core problem that all of us have to some degree, and that is self-centeredness. Uh, about it, you know, ambition is not a bad thing, but this was ambition not to accomplish something for God, but this was ambition so that way when Jesus establishes his kingdom, I want to be recognized. I want to be in a place of authority. Hey, if you're at the king's right hand and the left hand, you have a lot of connection and a lot of um, influence on the king, don't you? Uh, you're there all the time. Uh, you're around him. And so Jesus begins to deal uh, with these things and he confronts the incorrect view that one who has servants and maids is the greatest one. Now, I'm not sure if you've heard about a man, but I read a book a while ago, an autobiography it was entitled Up From Slavery. It was written by a gentleman by the name of Booker T. Washington. And uh, he invented a lot of uses of peanuts. And so if you have a peanut allergy, he may not be your favorite character in human history. Uh, but he had a lot of things with peanuts. And uh, he taught at Tuskegee University, Tuskegee Institute, which became Tuskegee University. And he was in that era in the United States history where the slaves were coming out of slavery and they were establishing themselves. And... And there's still that mentality. And, and one day, here is he, the president of Tuskegee Institute, the president of a university. And the chief lecturer sought to be uh, around the world, literally, at that time. And he was walking down the street. And this lady walks out of her house, sees Booker T. Washington walking down the street, and walks up to him and says, Sir, would you like some work? And he stops and says, what would you like, ma'am? And she says, well, I have some firewood that needs to be chopped and need, the logs need to be split and then they need to be carried into my house and, and put there so that way we could do our wood oven for the, for the winter, for the heat and all those other things. And he said, yes, ma'am, that's fine. I have time. I can do some work for you. And so out back he goes, rolls up his sleeves and gets the axe and begins to chop the wood and split it and, and get it all, you know, bundled and carried and brought into her house and stacked in, in nice rows. She paid him and on he went on his way, thinking nothing of it. And one day, as, as he, and as he went on his way and was walking out, one of her neighbors saw Booker T. Washington coming out of her house. Like, wow. And so off he's walking away, minding his own business. And this, you know how nosy neighbors can be sometimes. You know what I mean? Like they always comes over and goes. And she opens the door. And her neighbor goes, why did you have Booker T. Washington visiting your house? She's like, I didn't have Booker T. Washington visiting my house. I had some guy walk by that I just paid him to do some work for me. And, they, and she told her, No. That was Booker T. Washington. That was the president of Tuskegee University. That was, and when she realized who it was, she felt utterly embarrassed. And that next Monday, she 
goes into the university, makes an appointment with the president to sit in his office, and there he was across his desk. And she begins to apologize profusely because she said, I am so sorry. I, for some reason, I looked at you and I saw a, a former slave and I saw someone who needed work and I was just trying to help out and I'm really sorry. And he looks at her and says, what are you sorry for, ma'am? Every now and then, although I'm a lecturer in an office, I enjoy a little bit of physical labor and I had time on my, you asked me if I had time on my schedule to help you and I did, so I stopped and helped you. What's the big deal? I'm glad to help. And if you ever need help again, just ask. And she was just amazed. Well, little did he know, he, she went on her way and gathered up all of her rich friends and told them the story and raised hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to be donated to that university because the president was humble enough to not say, do you know who I am? When she asked him about chopping wood, but just went and chopped wood. Now, I know that's a little bit different, but the path of greatness of a servant can be reached through a series of steps, a series of choices. And so this, this evening, as we look at this passage of Scripture, and we, we look at this idea where Jesus is saying, no, 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 uh, my kingdom's not going to work that way. In my kingdom, the greatest will be the servant, because I am come not to be ministered unto, but I've come to what? What did Jesus come to? He came to minister and to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So if you're going to have, and if you're going to be great in the kingdom of God, you're not going to be powerful. You're not going to be prestigious. You're not going to be any of those things. You're going to have to be a servant, a humble servant. So the first thing you're going to have to do, you're going to have to make an individual choice. Can I tell you, serving others does not come naturally. We have to choose to do so. It's a personal, individual choice to serve. Look with me in Mark chapter 10 and verse 43. But so shall it be among you, but whosoever will be great among you. Look at verse 44. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest. You know that whosoever will or whosoever will of you. That implies, hey, he's saying to his disciples, listen, whoever of you will be chief among you will be servant. You know what he's saying? Whichever one among you chooses to be the servant of everyone, you'll be great in my kingdom. It's a personal choice. I don't know about you, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's nice when people serve you, but isn't it a choice? You have to choose to serve others, don't you? It's a personal choice. When Jesus came to earth, he did so voluntarily. He technically did not have to. He chose to. Now I, we know that was part of God's redemptive plan, so we knew he was going, but he still chose to. He chose to continue serving his disciples and demonstrate his love for them, even though they, he was close to the cross by washing their feet. In John chapter uh, 13, no one can decide for you to be a servant. No one. John could not decide for James. Hey, James, you're going to serve people today. John can't make that choice. James can make that choice for John. Only John could decide to serve the disciples and those around him. Only you can decide to serve and be a servant. There may be authorities over you who can tell you what to do, but can I tell you something? Compliance to instruction does not make you a servant. Just like, hey, parents should know this, right? Obedience to requests to clean your room does not mean the person is happily obeying, does it? It doesn't. Sometimes in the end, it, just any type of obedience will take, right? As long as the room gets clean, I don't care whether you're, just do it. But you know what? 
Come, if, if I were to come up to you, and, and as the pastor of the church, I'd come up to you, hey, um, you know, Caleb, could you go and grab that, that broom over there, and there's a puddle, there's, you know, a mop over there, and there's a puddle over there, can you just mop that up for me? And Caleb pops up, and he grabs the mop, and he mops up the water, and he gets it up for me. There's no puddle over there. There's no nothing, so don't, it's just an illustration. And he would do all that type of stuff. You know what? Did he mop up and do what I asked? Yes. But just because he complied doesn't mean he's a servant. Well, I don't know. I don't know his heart. I don't know the choices he made. He could be just doing it because I may have put him on the spot in front of everyone and everyone's looking at him and he may go, okay, well, rather than look like that, I'm just going to go do it. But, but I hate doing this. I'm never going to do this again. And matter of fact, I'm going to mop this up and I'm going to put it up and I'm going to walk out the door and I'm never going to come back to that place again. Well, that's not really a servant, is it? So compliance doesn't mean servanthood. It doesn't mean we're, we are serving. We only become servants when we choose of our own volition to humble ourselves and willingly serve others. That's why in those verses it says, whosoever of you will. The choice is yours. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, number one, step, first thing you got to do, you must choose of your own volition and of your own will to be a servant to other people. Now, sometimes, how can I put this kindly? Some people are easier to choose to serve than others. Yes? Is that a nice way of putting it? Oh, come on. When I said that, there are some, some people that have popped, and instantly a, a photograph of someone popped in their head, and they're like, yeah, that person's not the easiest to serve. Why? They might be demanding. They might be whatever. I don't know. Maybe, maybe your two personalities are like, you know, sandpaper together. You just irritate eat the fire out of each other. Hopefully that person, when you thought of someone who irritates the fire out of you, was not your spouse. Um, but anyways, uh, I don't know. Uh, but some people are easier to serve than others. But it's a willful choice to serve all. No matter if it's easy, no matter if it's hard, no matter if it's appreciated or not. So step one is you must make an individual choice. Step two, you need to ask God for inward change. Inward change. Even after we choose to serve, we do not immediately change from selfish to selfless. Do we? Like, I'm going to serve, I'm going to make a choice to serve now. All of a sudden, I never think of me. You know how I know everyone thinks of us ourselves? We all probably have full bellies. And if you don't have a full belly, you probably have a full belly by the time you go to bed, yes? Looking at everyone, we we're all dressed somewhat, you know, nicely and all those types of things. And we, 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 we've thought of ourselves. We, we've taken care of us. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is more than willing to give us a servant's heart. But we have to ask for it. In fact, he wants us to share the same mindset as Christ. And after all, in this passage of Scripture, Christ said he did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister. And he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You can't think of a more sacrificial way to serve than what Christ did. So as we begin to, to think about this and look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That, you notice that verb there, let, or 
uh, literally means to allow. And that is a command. It says, hey, allow this mind to be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to describe that mind. Who lowered himself, and he, he became a man, and he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, and, and on and on. It, it describes that there. And you know what? When we let the mind of Christ be in us, he causes us to think like he does. And Christ thinks to serve. Inward change begins, and now this is, I'm going to say this and let me explain. Inward change begins with your mind. Now I'm not saying it's a mind game. I'm not saying it's mind over matter. When we ask God to change us, he begins by renewing this. Renewing what we think about. Renewing how we think. How does he do that? As we intake the word, we renew our mind. The Holy Spirit changes our way of thinking and conforms it to the mind of Christ. And, and as he changes our thinking, our behavior will also change, will it not? What you think about is what you do. How you think is how you act. And so if Christ can renew your mind, if the Holy Spirit can renew your mind, if the Word of God can re wash your mind and renew your mind, then we begin to think and act more like Christ. So, make an individual choice to be a servant. Ask God to change you inside out and how you think. Number three, seek intentional connections with people. Sometimes opportunities to serve land right in your lap, don't they? I mean, a little while ago, uh, Emily went up to all the youth and young adults in some way, shape, or form, addressed them about uh, doing the meal and the opportunity to serve their church. And so in that instance, to all the youth and young adults, the opportunity to serve the rest of the church literally kind of fell into their laps, right? It was just kind of put on them and say, hey, you want to do this? And they went... Huh, okay, let's go. And they did a great job. But you know what? That's not generally how we serve. Sometimes, and most times, we need to intentionally seek out people to serve. There are two, there, I mean, and we need to do that in, in a very real way. Psalm, I mean, Mark 10, verse 43, it says, uh, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And that word minister there literally is it's used in Acts chapter 6 and it's translated serve. Acts chapter 6 and verse 2 it says, And the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to, and serve tables. And because of that, we know in, in Acts chapter 6, that's where we get deacons from. And, and deacons were there to serve and do those types of things. And so if we are to minister to others, it means we will serve them and seek out ways to do it. Seek out ways that we can do that. So we are to minister to others, but we are to do it from a posture of a servant. And we're to look for ways to do it. You know what? You'll find if you just began to sit and you began to talk to people, they're not going to come right out and say, this is what I need, this is what I, whatever. But a lot of times, you'll be able to figure out ways that you can serve and help people just by simply choosing to spend time with them and be around them. And you must choose and look for ways to serve. How can you serve others? Well, service begins by intentionally noticing others' needs. I don't know about you. If you're like me, I can see my needs faster than I can see anyone else's. Right? But service begins when we intentionally look for someone else's needs. But <laughs> are you a servant when you notice the needs of someone? And just go, huh, so-and-so needs this. Well, I'll pray for him. Or are you a servant when you go, oh, so-and-so needs this. 
I'll go do that for them. It's not enough just to notice a need. If we're going to be servants and we're going to be great in the kingdom of God, not only do we notice the need, but we do everything in our power to meet the need or to do the service or to be a help and, and be a blessing uh, to someone else. And uh, we must follow through with the ministry to those needs. This usually requires us to step out of our comfort zone. We all have one, don't we? This is what we're comfortable in. Usually when you notice the need of someone else and you, you're, it's going to require you to step outside of our box and go meet that need. Can I tell you something? No one grows inside their comfort zone. They stay exactly the same as they are. The times that we grow is the times that we step beyond what we're comfortable with, beyond our normal expectations, beyond the, the every day that we're, we're used to, and look and meet a need. And so as we, as we think of that, we can you know, look for a guest at church to introduce yourself. Make them welcome. We had visitors this morning, and uh, as I was talking to them, uh, one of the, both of them made mention of um, Nathan. Good old Nathan. Uh, here's this little, little child, walks straight up to them, says, Hi, my name is Nathan. I hope you had a good day at our church. And your name is? Hey, he made a willful choice to serve someone else and to try to make someone feel welcome. Now, I know that's just Nathan. That's just him. You know, he's, he's happy and yeah, that's just the way he is, at least at church. I don't know. His dad may be looking at me going, huh, come home with me someday. I don't know. <laughs> but, but you know, sometimes if you see someone, maybe for you it's not outside of your comfort zone to say hi and talk to people. Yep, it's outside of my comfort zone to walk up to someone and a complete shaker and say, hey, how you doing? I'll be like, yeah, no, thank you. You can go talk to them. Uh, but that's how we grow. That's how we can do that. Well, maybe it's a visiting or, or calling on a, you know, a widow or a shut-in or, or something like that and, and encourage them with, with fellowship. Sometimes you don't have to give much. Sometimes some people, all they need is someone to chat with them, spend some time with them, let them know someone cares. Send a, uh, you notice someone's missing, well, you know, send them a message, on, you know, just send them an SMS, let them know that they're missed, give them a phone call, let, let them know that you're praying for them. Volunteer to help, you know, maybe, if, maybe it's a church event, volunteer to help clean up or write a note to someone that, that served and did something for you and, and just thank them for what they've done. Something. Hey, God created the church to be a body of believers who serve one another. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So let me ask you a question. Are you serving your church family? Are you actively engaged in building others up through your personal service to them for Christ? So step one, make an individual choice to be a servant. Step two, ask God for inward change. Number three, make an intentional choice to step out of your comfort zone and connect with people. And step four, embrace an invaluable cause. Jesus gives a, go back to John chapter 10 and verse 45. Jesus is teaching them about serving and how does he end it and connect it and tie it all together. Mark chapter 10. He says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Do you know what? When Christ came to earth, he could have demanded others to serve him. 
But when he came to earth, he chose to be born in a poor family in very humble surroundings and then spent his entire life serving others. Ultimately, he served the entire world when he gave his life a ransom for many. If Christ was willing to give his life to serve us, can we do no less than to give our lives to serve him? Paul's gratitude for God's salvation motivated him to give up everything and surrender his life to serve God wholeheartedly. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, it, it sums up his life's calling. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. He simply says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Years ago, in London, there was an advertisement that occurred in a London newspaper. Here's what it said. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, Constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Does that sound like something you want to sign up for? The ad was signed Sir Ernest Shackleford, Shackleton, Antarctic Explorer. And you know, thousands instantly responded to the call. Thousands responded to this call. Men wanted hazardous journey, small wagers, bitter cold, long months of cold, complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And because one Antarctic explorer signed the ad, thousands answered the call. Thousands signed up for it to sacrifice their life for a cause. Should we do no less for a cause far greater than exploring the Antarctic? What would stop you from serving God who's given everything to save you? Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable Service. Hey, some give their lives serving their country. And you know, those of us who live in a country where people did that to secure our freedom, we are forever grateful, aren't we? Others give their lives in finding a cure for a disease. And if you have that disease they found a cure for, you're glad, grateful they did. And others give their lives to end poverty. People will give their lives to what they value most. As a Christian who received the invaluable gift of salvation, should we hesitate in giving our lives for the cause of Christ? Jesus taught us that the way we give ourselves to him is by serving other people. Are you seeking greatness this evening? Remember that the world's definition of greatness is the opposite of Jesus. Jesus said, the greatest is the servant of all. God's honor is given to the lowly, not the lofty. The opportunity to serve others are all around you. If we will just humble ourselves and follow the steps of our Savior and minister to the needs of others. And so as we continue on and looking at this idea of having uh, one purpose this year, may we be a church that is willing to say, you know what, I'll follow these steps and I will seek to the best of my ability as enabled by the Holy Spirit to live my life looking to serve others. You say, well, what? But then will I be served? Hey, listen, if you have 40 people, let's say 40 people, 
all looking to serve others, and you're one, how many people do you have looking to serve you? One minus 40 is 39, right? I'm just using a number off the top of my head. I don't. I'm just, does that, you understand? You're looking around going, where is there 40 people here? No. <laughs> but just say, 40 people. So if, if you're looking out for you, well, you got one person. But if you're living your life to serve the other 39, then you have 39 other people looking out for you. I don't know about you, but 39 can probably do a better job than one. That's the way God intends his church to be, his kingdom to be, and the greatest of his kingdom are not the ones who walk up and say, Jesus, grant to me to sit on your right hand or your left hand. No, 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 no. The greatest in his kingdom, he, he told them, he said, guys, that's not for me to give. You want that position? Be the servant of all. Father, we come before you this evening. And Lord, we pray that you help us in our minds to have the word of God change our thinking. And Lord, to be great, may we serve. May we not seek power, may we not seek prestige or uh, fame or money or any of those things. But Lord, may we seek to serve others as you served. You came to be ministered, minister unto people, not to be ministered unto. And to serve and to give your life a ransom for many. Lord, I pray that you would enable us as, as individuals and as, as a church and as believers uh, to follow your example. And Lord, may we be a, a group of people known for serving you by serving those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Son? The last song we're singing tonight is I Am Resolved. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the last verses of this song tonight. Things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great desires, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin. One, he had the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great desires, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. May oppose me, foes may beset me, still I will learn to read. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Thank you once again for coming out this evening. We look forward to seeing everyone Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, um, via the Zoom link for our Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, if you ha would like to take some of the gospel invitations or the tracts to letterbox the area where you live, uh, please do so. There's a couple of them on the table if you want them. Grab them, bring them home, uh, go for a walk and invite people to church, share the gospel with others. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back Wednesday evening. Let's go close the service in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to once again assemble together. And Lord, I just pray that you help us as we go from this place. Lord, may we actively seek ways to be able to serve one another, to be able to be an encouragement and a help to those around us. Most importantly, the greatest way we can serve people is by uh, living out the gospel and sharing the gospel with people around us. And Lord, we pray that you help us as we go from this place uh, to be a witness for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.